Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua the Christ. We ought to give thanks to God always concerning you, brothers, as it is right, because increased greatly does your faith and abound does the love of each one of you all to one another. So that we ourselves glory in you in the assemblies of God for your endurance and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you are bearing. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, for your being counted worthy of the reign of God, for, your, for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to give back to the ones troubling you trouble, and to you who are troubled, rest with us in the revelation of the Lord Yeshua from heaven, with the messengers of his power and flaming fire, giving vengeance to the ones not knowing God and to the ones not obeying the good news of our Lord Yeshua the Christ, who shall suffer justice, destruction age lasting from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his strength, when he may come to be glorified in his holy ones and to be marveled at in all the ones believing because our testimony was believed among you in that day, for which also we pray always concerning you, in order that our God may count you worthy of the calling and may fulfill all the good pleasure of goodness and work of faith and power, so that the name of our Lord Yeshua the Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and Lord Yeshua the Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, just thank you and praise you so much for your provision in all things. Just thank you for your grace toward us, um, your unconditional love and your mercy. Thank you, Father, for giving us life and that eternal through your Son. Pray for David this morning that you would give him clarity of thought to teach us from your word. Give us ears to hear, Father, what you would have for us this day. Amen. Thank you, David. You may be seated. You know, after listening to that um, persecuted church segment, just wonder if anybody would take, like to take a minute and complain about something. <laughs> We seem to find a lot of things to complain about in this country. When you hear stuff like that, though, I, and that, that really is the purpose of doing the persecuted church, to kind of reset our thinking each week to what we have here is not normal, okay? People around the world are suffering and dying for their faith in Christ. I was actually excited that somebody fought back, Sharon. It seems like they never, they never respond. They just they suffer it, never respond. This guy at least threw a rock, um, you know. <clears throat> I wanted to share something with you, an email I got before we get started this morning. This is, uh, I got this right after the conference. It says, Dear Pastor Curtis, the BBC elders, Bob C., Glenn H., Michael S., Zach D., and Gary D., singers, musicians, wives, and families. He wanted to make sure everybody got in there, okay? He says, wow, in caps, bold. I loved every single speaker and every single message at the conference this week especially the Blue Collar Scholars Eschatological Study of the Book of Mordecai and Esther. He goes, wow, I am going to watch Gog and Magog, parts one and two, again tomorrow. He says, thank you to everybody for all your hard work, especially thanks to Garrett, who is very special to us out here in Cyberville. I sure appreciate how you wave to us as you walk by the camera on Saturday. Pretty sure I'm not the only one that waved back. <laughs> thanks, Garrett. And... Uh, he said, P.S., I believe many, many of us live streamers are starting to plan now to attend next year. Well, I hope so, but you're going to have to get it in early because, like I said, we're, we're keeping it at 100. We're not going over 100 for the conference. It's just, um, it was nice having a lot of people there, but it was hard getting to everybody and talking to everybody. You know, when it's a smaller group, it's a little more intimate. You get to know people better, and so, yeah, so 100 is the small group we're sticking with, <laughs> so... Besides, we can't, uh, nobody else can fit in that place, so we're going to go with that. 
All right, I think we're ready. Let's get started this morning. Good morning, Bereans. Good morning. We're going to continue our study this morning of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to kind of focus on verse 10 this morning. Uh, I want to remind you again, verses 3 through 10 are one long, complicated sentence in the Greek, and they did, which deals with the second coming. That's the subject matter. That's what these verses talk about, and I'm going to do my best to finish this sentence this morning. All right, we've been working at this for a while now. <clears throat> Let's look at verses 9 and 10. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Now we focused for, we spent three weeks just on this little phrase here, punishment of eternal destruction. And I said in our three-part series that... Uh, in verse 9, that this phrase, most commentators, as a matter of fact, every one I've found, I haven't found one that hasn't, says this phrase refers to hell. And by that they mean eternal conscious torment. And I hope by now that I've demonstrated that's not what this means at all. We saw that Paul uses this word that he used for destruction here. Olathros is used of death, and it's used of national judgment. Nowhere is it used anywhere different than that. And so we talked a lot about national judgment, and you need to hang on to that thought. This punishment, this destruction, is about national judgment that was to come upon Jerusalem. Now, when was this natural, national judgment to occur? Well, Paul says, when he comes. And this is a reference to the second coming of Christ. This identifies the time of the righteous judgment spoken of in this text, when he comes here is literally whenever he shall come. When is hatan, it's a temporal particle pointing to that which is expected to occur in an indefinite future, but not specified as to the exact time. So it's just like, well, this will happen whenever he comes. But we can nail down the time of this coming because of other key elements related to that that are in this text. For example, let's look at back up to 6 and 7. He says, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Yeshua is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, let me ask you a question here. Who's Paul talking to in these verses? The Thessalonians. What Thessalonians? The first century, that's important. The first century Thessalonians, that's when he wrote this, okay? Very important. In verse 1, Paul says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. First century, there was a church. He's writing to that church, and he assures them this church is under persecution. They're suffering. And so Paul is assuring them, listen, when he comes... In, when the Lord returns, He's going to deal with these people that are persecuting you, and He's going to give you relief. So He assures them that God's going to repay with affliction those who afflict. And those who afflict who? Any and all believers? No, it's those who afflict you, the Thessalonians. The people that are afflicting you, and I'm going to grant relief to you. So clearly, Paul is telling the first century Thessalonian believers that they're going to receive relief from suffering. When? When they died? No, he said it would occur when the Lord Yeshua is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. So, if the Lord has not returned yet, as most of the church believes, what did this mean to the Thessalonians? Nothing at all. Well, in a couple thousand years, I'll come and give relief to you. I don't need relief anymore. I'm dead. It's about as relieved as you're going to get, all right? The second coming in this text is called the revelation of Yeshua. So this, like I said, wouldn't mean anything to them if he hadn't. It would matter of fact, it'd be deceptive to give them this hope that there's a, a relief that's coming to them, but it's thousands of years in the future. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you a, a serious question here, and you need to think about this. Can you show me something in this letter that would indicate 
that Paul switched his intended audience from the first century Thessalonians to some group thousands of years in the future. Anything in here that could do that? Not that I see. It's written to them. It's written to them alone. It's not talking about something thousands of years they don't care about, they're not going to be around for. Commenting on this passage, John MacArthur writes this. He says, who's going to feel this just retribution? And there in verse 6 it says, those who afflict you. That is, those who persecute Christians. So he just makes it a lump. Anybody who persecutes Christians is going to get this. Anybody through all time? You know, he, he just, that's what so many do. They just take this away from the first century audience like it means nothing to them. Well, Paul says that Christ will come on that day. On what day? Well, this is a clear reference to the day of the Lord. And we looked at this in 1 Thessalonians 5.2. It says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And we saw when we studied this verse that the day of the Lord is an event that happens between the two ages. It happened between this age and the age to come. If you look at Zechariah 14, you see that it teaches us that the day of the Lord and the destruction of Jerusalem are connected. So the destruction of Jerusalem, which was the day of the Lord, marked the end of one age, the old covenant age, the Jewish age, and began a new age, the Christian age, the age of the new covenant. Day of the Lord is used throughout the Tanakh, and it's used of God judging various nations. But it's only used four times in the New Testament, and every time it refers to Jerusalem. That's the day of the Lord is for Jerusalem in the New Testament. So in that day is literally placed at the end of the verse in Greek for emphasis. In the expositor's commentary, Robert Thomas explains this. The de- that day is a frequent Old Testament designation for the day of the Lord. In the present verse, it solemnly emphasizes a time coincident with when he comes, as it does repeatedly in the New Testament. That's right, it's when he comes on that day. Christ is coming on the day of the Lord to bring judgment. Now, on that day is, echoes the thought of Isaiah 2, 11 and 17 in the Septuagint. And it's interesting because this is the same chapter that Paul quotes from several times in verse 9, and now he's quoting again from it in verse 10. Isaiah 2, 10 and 11 say, Enter into the rock and hide the dust from before the terror of Yahweh. So, This is God's judgment. They want to hide from the terror and from the splendor of His majesty. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, the lofty pride of man shall be humbled, and Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. In the day of the Lord. It will be an exaltation. We'll see that later in our verse. In 2.17 he says, And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled. The lofty pride of man shall be brought low, and Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. Now, the wording of our text in 2 Thessalonians 1.10 appears to continue this reflection on Isaiah 2, where twice it is said, the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. There, exalted is roughly synonymous with the repeated mention of God's glory in Isaiah 2, 10, 2, 19, and 2.21, which we looked at in verse 9. So this expression of glorifying or exalting God in that day is unique in all biblical literature. I think we're familiar with Isaiah 66. It portrays the eschatological judgment of idolaters who don't seek God's glory in contrast to the saints who glorify God. Well, Isaiah 2 supplements Isaiah 66 because it too repeatedly highlights God's glory. Now, as we saw earlier in this text, He will return in flaming fire. That's the text, our text in Thessalonians. And I think this adds the note of holy judgment and justice to be rendered. Fire is an instrument of judgment throughout Scripture. And number 16, this is talking about Korah and his rebellion. And the fire came out from Yahweh and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. How'd you like to be there and picture that? Fire, just flames come out of heaven and these 250 people are toast. Okay, ashes fall into the ground. How about Leviticus 10, 1 and 2? Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took, this was their ordination day, Nadab and Abihu's. 
They took a censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before Yahweh. We're not sure what they did wrong, but they did something they weren't supposed to, <clears throat> which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. So this is their ordination day. Uh, they violate what God had told them to do, and God's justice wipes them out. And I think we have to un <coughs> excuse me, understand that it's going to be a painful execution of judgment. That's what the Thessalonians, that's what he's writing to them. I'm going to deal with these people that are afflicting you. And if you want to understand the severity of this affliction, what really happened in AD 70, Josephus' book, War of the Jews, goes into great detail. I mean, it's horrifying what happened in the city during that time. So, did Yeshua come in the first century and bring judgment on those who were persecuting the first century Thessalonians? Did he? He said he was going to, did he, or did he not do what he said he was? Of course he did. He said he was going to do it. He did it, just as he said he would. It, now, if he didn't do it, then we have a problem. It makes Christ a false prophet. It means, what else did he say that was wrong? He said he was coming soon, and that's what he did. Well, we have a problem because the partial preterists, which are still futurists, Okay, yeah, partial future. They're not, uh, yeah, they're futures. The, you know, what's interesting, the partial preterists are our greatest attackers, okay? They're the ones who hate us. They're the ones who uh, have taken salvation away from us because if we believe like we do, they say, well, you're not even a Christian. You know, they've, they've added to the gospel eschatology. And I can't find that in the Bible, but somehow they found it because they're just terrible enemies of ours because of that. But the partial preterist would say that these verses only refer to his coming in judgment on Israel and not to his second advent. So then they see two different comings, right? Well, yeah, in 87 he came on Jerusalem, but he's coming again. So wouldn't that make a future advent a third coming? Let me ask you this. Do you see anywhere in the creeds, because the creeds are super important to them, where there would be two returns of the Lord in judgment. The, the, the creeds don't talk about two different returns. So they violate their own creeds that they swear by, by saying, well, there's going to be another one. It doesn't say that in the creeds, but the creedal partial preterists, they hold to that. Now, I want to share with you a couple of thoughts from a couple of videos that I watched this week. <clears throat> Doug from Richmond a friend of mine, he constantly sending me things. Did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? I'm like, no, 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 no. Some of them I watch. All right? If they catch my attention, I watch them. But <clears throat> in a YouTube video titled White Boy Summer Heretics and the Reformed Autistic Bros on Full Preterism, Toby Sumter. Now listen, I, before these videos this week, I have never heard of Toby Sumter. I have no idea who he is. I didn't know anything about him. All right, so I Googled him to find out who is this guy. Okay, well, according to Google, he's the pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. He's also the pastor of Trinity Reformed Church in Moscow, Idaho. He's also the pastor of King's Cross Church in Moscow, Idaho. Now, I don't know if he pastors three churches. I don't know if he keeps changing the name of the church. I don't know if he keeps getting fired and going to another church. I don't understand it, but Google has him pastoring all those churches. And I couldn't find any timeline. So if you know something about Toby and what's going on over there, you can fill me in on that and let me know. But here's what Toby uh, has to say about us preterists. He says, there's like five hyper preterists in the world, and they all live in a bunker somewhere in Arkansas. Well, Toby, let me give you a little information. There's four hyperpreters that meet in Benton, Arkansas. There's about 10 that meet in Magnolia, a little further south. And there's two full preterist churches in northwest Arkansas alone. So, Toby, your numbers are a little bit skewed there. You might want to do a little more research. There are hundreds of thousands of us, I believe, that believe in the full preterist view. All right? And then Toby says this. He says, full preterism is heresy. And by that he means we're not Christians. 
That's his view of us. But my question, why does he care? There's only five of us, and we're in a bunker anyway, so <laughs> why would you care what we believe or what we think or what we do, okay? All right, let's go to another video that to Toby did that uh, we want to look at here. It, he calls it the Gary DeMar debunkle, okay? Debacle. Debacle, yes. And he has some interesting, debunkle. thank you, wife. He has debunkle. I'm going to debunk his debacle. <laughs> I'm thinking debunk. I'm going to debunk his debacle. All right. Sumter says this. One particular exegetical question I've raised with Gary, and I got a hold of Gary and said, did Toby ask you this? And Gary said, I'm not sure. I've gotten so much correspondence, I can't. Because I wanted to know, is he just blowing smoke here? Did he actually talk to Gary? Because he said, I talked to Gary about this stuff. I wanted to know if he did. I've raised Gary is why the text he walks through must be judged as past or future. Why not consider the possibility that some of them are both past and future? So we got past this, we got future, just throw them all together. Let's stop here for one second. And let me ask you this. What New Testament texts talk about a second coming, a general judgment, or a resurrection that is far off from the reader's perspective. Can you think of any verses? Can you think of any verse maybe in the Tanakh that talks about something being far off? Daniel talks about, seal it up, it's a long time in the future, and it was referring to 600 years. So 600 years, a long time, seal it up. In the New Testament, we said, unseal it, the time is at hand. So I don't know how you get 2,000 years, but here's the problem. There's no verses. There's not a text in Scripture that says, and this will happen in the distant future, in a far time away, in a land far away, and whatever, okay? There is none. Now, there are a few texts that do not have a time stamp with them, but very few. But you can look in their surroundings and find out what's actually going on there. Most texts... Say this is soon, shortly, quickly, <clears throat> while some of you are still alive that are standing here, this generation, it's at hand, the judge is at the door, on and on and on. I mean, he uses everything he could use to just say it's coming soon, okay? Toby goes on to say, why not consider the possibility that some of them are both past and future? Oh, good. They're both. This is a precedence. For this, in, there is a precedence for this in biblical prophecy. For example, Isaiah 7.14 says, and he quotes this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So this is the, this is the precedence that they use, that this shows us that it can be quick and hand, because this, Sumter goes on to say, that prophecy had a very immediate fulfillment time stamp. <laughs> Was that confusing you, Sharon? You don't, you don't get what he's saying? So listen, it's what Sumter is saying. That prophecy we read in Isaiah had a very immediate fulfillment. So, 700 years before Christ, a virgin had a child and named him God with us. Right? That's basically what Sumter's saying. And my question is, where in the record in Isaiah is the, this fulfillment? Where does Isaiah record this? Sumter says, there will be a sign, this will be a sign, that the immediate looming threats of Syria and Samaria will soon fade away. So, what will be a sign? A virgin having a child that they call Emmanuel? The immediate context and wording of Isaiah 7 demonstrates that this prophecy was not fulfilled in the time of Isaiah. J.A. Alexander writes this, The assurance that Christ was to be born in Judah of its royal family might be assigned to Isaiah, that the kingdom should not perish in that day. In other words, he's just saying, God is trying to reassure him the line will continue because in the future you're going to have the Messiah will be born to this line, all right? And so far was the remoteness of the sign in this case for making it absurd or inappropriate that the further off it was, the stronger the promise of continuance to Judah 
which it guaranteed. In other words, he's just continuing. The, the nation of Judah will continue. All right? Now, the Lord had instructed Ahaz to ask for a sign. What sign did he ask for? None. He refused. No, I'm not going to ask for a sign. Okay. So, therefore, the prediction given was not to Ahaz. And that's where I think people mess up. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you. Who's the you? Well, the Hebrew here, you, is plural. Which I see as referring to the house of David. The house of David has been unfaithful to the Lord. And it is to them that this prophetic sign, this promise, is given. D.A. Carson writes this. Isaiah 7, 1 through 9, 7 must be read as a unit. In other words, you can't just isolate these verses. 714 must not be treated in isolation. The promised Emmanuel, 714, will possess the land, 88, thwart all opponents, 810, appear in Galilee of the Gentiles, 91, as a great light to those in the land of the shadow of death, 92. He is the child and son called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, in 9.6, whose government and peace will never end as he reigns on David's throne forever. So this prophecy is talking about only one person, Yeshua. Ahaz in the house of David stood in disobedience to the Lord, and the sign given was prophetic, and it pointed toward the day when the Lord Yeshua the Christ would come into the world, and God would truly dwell with His people. And the house of Judah could know that God was not done with the nation Israel. But Sumter goes on to say, and yet, Matthew cites that prophecy, cites that prophecy, referring to Isaiah 7, 14, and says it, will, it was also, note the word also, talking about Mary conceiving as a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's possible that the first virgin birth, Isaiah foretold, wasn't a Holy Spirit conception. Yeah, that's what I say. What? Okay, so basically, Sumter sees two virgin births. This was, pars this was fulfilled at that time, and then you got, see, this is the scripture you go to if you want to prove dual fulfillment. But I don't get where they get the first fulfillment in this text, okay? He said the first one may not have been by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so a virgin gets pregnant, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit this time. How did that happen? And this virgin had a baby and she said, God with us. No, it wasn't. Listen, listen, people. This man calls us heretics. He calls us heretics, but he's got the virgin birth back in Isaiah. <laughs> he says, and yet Matthew cites that prophecy, cites that prophecy and says it was also taught. Matthew doesn't say anything about also. He says, oh yeah, this also was, this is the second fulfillment of this. Matthew doesn't say that at all. It's not what he says. Did Isaiah predict two virgin births? No, he did not. How was this prophecy fulfilled immediately? How could anyone else but Yeshua be called God with us? Matthew tells us when this prophecy was fulfilled. Speaking to Mary, he says this, She will bear a son. You shall call his name Yeshua. For he will save his people from their sins. Yeshua means God's, God saves. All right? That's why she's going to call him that, because he's going to save his people. All this, took, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And then he's going to quote Isaiah 7, 14. So he is saying, listen, this fulfills what Isaiah said. This is the fulfillment. He didn't say, this also fulfills. This is the second time a virgin had a, a God, okay? <laughs> no, not at all. All right, Charles Dyer writes this. The only safe approach to determining the fulfillment of prophecy is first to understand the prophecy in its original context. 
then must, one must examine new, the New Testament to see if the prophecy corresponds to the latter events that actually transpire. Biblical fulfillment occurs when the meaning of a specific Old Testament prophecy finds its exact correspondence in a New Testament person, activity, or event. Once. Once. Not dual. Sumter goes on to say, the apocalyptic error ending judgment language of collapsing solar systems and blowing trumpets and Christ's coming are typological language that many often have that may often have near or immediate fulfillments. They may, now watch this, but always point to a final judgment, a final coming, and a true end of human history. So yeah, these things have a you know they may have some immediate fulfillment, but that's just pointing to something else. Well, maybe that something else is pointing to something else too. And that one's pointing. How many, how many of these go on? When do we decide? I, this blows my mind. It also, listen, always point to a final judgment. So whatever text you're in, whatever it's talking about, it may have been fulfilled, but it's just pointing to something else. Now, I'm going to show you that's definitely wrong. First of all, let me ask you something. What kind of hermeneutic is this? What kind of hermeneutic is this? Yeah, we have another virgin birth. The Holy Spirit had nothing to do with this one. I'm not sure who had to do with this one then. And what happened to the God that was produced by that? All right. Let me ask you this. Was you? Sh- I'm getting a little worked up here. I got to calm down. <laughs> I just These are the people that attack us for believing what the Bible says. So was Yeshua wrong when speaking of AD 70 destruction, when he said this, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. But there's always, but it always points to something else, right? So Yeshua said this, there will never be anything like this. But Sumter says, oh, yes, there will be, because there's always something else in the future. Well, let's get the context here on this verse. You know, Matthew 24, Yeshua's answering the disciples' questions about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's the discussion. They wanted to know, when is Jerusalem going to be destroyed, and what signs will precede the coming and the end of the age? You know, when is this going to happen? You're coming. When are we going to know about this? Well, after talking about the abomination of desolation which was Jerusalem surrounded by armies, according to Luke 21. See, sometimes you just go to the parallel text and they explain things to us. Yeshua taught about the Great Tribulation. Now, is Matthew 24 talking about an event yet future to us or something that happened in the time of the disciples? Well, the Scriptures, I think, are clear that the Great Tribulation is past. I'm sorry. I know that disappoints some people. They were looking forward to this, you know. It's over. Listen, preterism is the most encouraging, positive eschatology that there is. We're not looking forward to doom and gloom and destruction and blood to the, hortal, to the horse's bridle. We're not looking for that. Okay? It happened in the first century. He says, for then there will be a great tribulation. When is then? Within a few thousand years? No, the then is found in the context of verse 15 through 20 when Yeshua told his disciples that when they see the abomination of desolation, in other words, the surrounding of Jerusalem by armies, Luke 21, they were to know that the the desolation was near. And this happened in AD 67 when Cestius Gallus, the Roman general, laid siege to Jerusalem. The Great Tribulation is therefore not an event future to us. It occurred then during the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans in the first century. And this is made abundantly clear in the parallel text in Luke's Gospel. Luke says, Luke 21, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. That, is that hard to figure out? Look at these armies are surrounding the city. They're putting up a siege wall. We're in trouble. All right? 
This city's desolation is near. Then, he says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. If you're in there, get out. Let those who are inside the city depart and let those who are out in the country and let not those who are out in the country enter it. Don't go there. That would be the natural thing to do because Jerusalem is a fortress. We got armies, let's go to the fort. We'll be safe in the fortress. No, the Lord said, no, get out of there. That fortress is coming down. He says, for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Also for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath, watch, wrath against this people. What people? Who, who's this people? Everybody? Yes, those are the Israelites, the Judeans. They will fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Now, notice whom, in, notice whom in particular the tribulation would come upon. He says it's coming upon the earth, and this is the Greek word gay. And it refers, gay is earth, it's land, basically. And that's how most would interpret this. Come upon the land, referring to the land of Israel. And the wrath against this people, again, referring to the first century Judeans. It has nothing to do with the world future to us. And in Luke 21, 22, very important verse, this time when Jerusalem is surrounded, when Jerusalem is being destroyed, Luke says, these are the days of vengeance. In other words, God is getting vengeance on these people for their sin. And it says, to fulfill all that is written. So Luke tells us here that all that's written will be fulfilled in the destruction of the city. What does he mean by that? Well, all that is written refers to prophecy. All prophecy was to be fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. When that city was destroyed, that fulfilled it. Daniel tells us the very same thing in Daniel 9.24, because Daniel's prophecy tells of a time when all prophecy would cease to be given and what had been given would be fulfilled. When would it be? Well, Daniel's vision ends with the destruction of Jerusalem, which we know occurred in AD 70. So Luke is clearly saying the same thing that Daniel said. At the time that Jerusalem is destroyed, all prophecy is fulfilled. What does that include? That would include the prophecy of the second coming, the prophecy of the resurrection. These prophecies that people are still putting in the future, okay? Sumter's putting these in the future. But Luke says when the city is destroyed, all these are fulfilled, Okay? The new heavens and the new earth, all that, everything prophesied to Israel will be fulfilled at the time of Jerusalem's destruction. Now, let me correct the mistake that people want to make here. They say, well, you preterists say it all ended in AD 70. All prophecy was fulfilled. It didn't all end there. It's ongoing, okay? We are in the new heavens and new earth. We are in the new covenant, and it's going forth, and the gospel is still going out. It didn't end there. It began in AD 70, Okay? Just to make that clear, but this is the end of prophecy. All prophecy was fulfilled. So there's nothing future. And again, there's no verses in the New Testament that say, in a long time, this will happen. Hang on, it's going to be a long time off. Look at Daniel 12, 1. At that time shall Michael, the great prince who is in charge of your people, again, Daniel's people, Israel, Judeans, 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 yeah, I'll get it right. <laughs> Yeah, I just washed my tongue, can't do a thing with it. <laughs> and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation. Does that sound familiar? That seems like I just read. Oh, that's right. Yeshua just said that. A great tribulation, like there never will be. Now notice the next verse in Daniel. He says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is the resurrection of the just and the unjust, and it happens at the time of Jerusalem's destruction. So does the second coming. This is so important for us to understand. The completion of the plan of redemption, the fulfillment of all prophecy were tied up in Jerusalem's destruction. It was an age-changing event. <clears throat> William Kimball, in his book, 
what the Bible says about the Great Tribulation said this, This period of Great Tribulation is not an event which the entire world is yet awaiting, but a past historic event of unparalleled concentrated severity, specifically afflicting the Jewish nation in AD 70. Listen, the Jews were the ones, Christ was their Savior. He came to His own, and His own received Him not. They rejected Him, so the judgment was on them. They cried out, His blood be on us and on our children. And it was. This was a monumental event, covenant-changing event. It wasn't just the fall of a city. Now, Sumter goes on in this same video to say, I want to be clear. Denying a central creedal confession doctrine, like the coming of Christ in person to raise our physical bodies from their graves, and the final judgment is a deadly and lethal disease like the Black Plague. Now, notice here, it's denying, he doesn't say denying Scripture, okay, we're not, we, he doesn't even bring Scripture into it, denying a central creedal confession doctrine. You know why he doesn't bring Scripture into it? Because the things he's talking about, Scripture doesn't talk about, okay? The Scripture doesn't talk about Christ coming in person. Like there's some bodily man coming on a riding, riding on some white cloud coming in. The, the scriptures don't talk about physical bodies coming out of graves. The confessions talk about this, so he can't appeal to scripture. Nowhere in the New Testament is it stated that the parousia, that Christ is going to come in the flesh. It doesn't talk about a physical bodily return of Christ. Let's look at just a few second coming texts. Mark, he says in Mark 13, 21. And then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ. Or look there. He is. Don't believe it. Don't worry, but don't believe that. Why not believe it? Yeshua seems to stress that his coming is not going to be physical bodily coming. If someone could says, here's the Christ or there's the Christ, don't believe it. Why not? Because he's not coming in a physical body. If he did, someone would be able to say, hey, he's over there. They were not to believe it because the coming was not going to be that way. So how would they see his coming? Well, they'd see it in the judgment that was to fall. And that's what we don't understand. The Christ coming was a judgment coming. And they say, yes, he did come in a judgment coming in 87, but he's coming again. The, one we, the, the coming we have no verses for. He's coming again, but we have creeds to back it up. Revelation 1.7, Behold, He's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see Him, even those who pierce Him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of Him, even so, amen. Now, if someone brought you this verse and says, See, everybody's going to see it. He's coming in the clouds. Everybody's going to know. How do you deal with that? What would you say to them? I would say, yeah, who is this written to? And did you notice in the first three verses he said, soon and shortly? And did you notice in the last chapter, five times, he says, soon, soon, soon? That's seven, so this book is bracketed by time statements. Who is this book written to? It's written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And he even lists the churches. And you're not one of them. But, you know, again, we just we pull it out of its context. Audience relevance doesn't matter anymore. John said this was to happen soon. He said those who pierced him would wail at his coming. Who pierced him? <laughs> we must see that this is not a physical bodily coming of Christ. It's a judgment coming. The idea of seeing here is not, oh, look, I see him with my eyes. It's to recognize, to be aware of, to perceive the destruction of Jerusalem would cause the tribes of the earth to recognize that Yeshua was indeed the Son of Man. He was the Messiah. Let's look at that last quote of Toby again. He talks about coming of Christ in person to raise the physical bodies. We see here that, that he puts the resurrection at the same time as the judgment, at the same time as the coming, and that's good. He's got them all together just in the wrong place. 
And to prove his doctrine, he cites this, Job 19. And this is to prove the doctrine of the physical resurrection, okay? And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. So Job says, yet in my flesh I shall see God. So everyone says, see that? He's going to get his body, and then he'll see God in his body. The only problem with this verse is the Hebrew. Okay? Because in the Hebrew, this is not a correct translation. As a matter of fact, this is the exact opposite of what the Hebrew says. Kyle and Delich, who are some of the most respected Old Testament commentators, translate verse 26 this way. And after my skin thus torn to pieces... And without my flesh shall I behold Eloah. In their commentary in verse 26, Kyle and Delich write this. We cannot in this speech find that the hope of a bodily recovery is expressed. Because there is none expressed there, but that's their go-to verse. Okay? So the Bible doesn't teach a physical resurrection, but it does tell us the time of the resurrection. The scriptures testify that the time of the resurrection was to be at the end of the old covenant age. Daniel says in 12, 13, But go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Now, we know this to have happened in AD 70 with the destruction of the Jewish temple. The disciples knew that the fall of the temple and the destruction of the city meant the end of the old covenant age and the inauguration of the new age. There's only one second coming, and it happened in AD 70. Almost every commentator agrees that Revelation 1-7 is the theme verse of Revelation. Behold, He is coming in the clouds. And this is reminiscent of cloud comings in the Tanakh when Yahweh came in judgment. See, you can't start at the last quarter of the Bible and think you understand the language of it. Because all the language from the last quarter comes from the first three quarters. And so if you just get in there and you say, well, the stars are falling from the sky. I know what that means. The stars are those lights up there, and they're going to fall down, and I guess they're going to hit the earth or whatever, you know. Go back, and what does that language mean? It's talking about the collapse of a nation, okay? So if we go back to Psalm 104.3, he lays the beams of his chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. And then this is a verse you need to know and understand because this is going to be good in helping people understand the New Testament, this whole cloud riding and all this stuff. An oracle concerning Egypt. An oracle, an oracle is a pronouncement of judgment, pronouncement of damnation against Egypt. And it says, Behold, Yahweh is riding on a swift cloud. Now, in this culture, Baal was the cloud rider. That's He's known as the storm god, the cloud rider. And the writer said, no, no, you guys are confused. Yahweh is the cloud rider. And he comes to Egypt. The idols of Egypt are going to tremble at his presence. The heart of the Egyptians will melt within him. Now, you read this verse, you're like, okay, Yahweh's there. He rode in on this cloud. You looked up on a, I guess it was a white cloud, and, you know, he floated in, and he was standing like on a surfboard, and his presence was there, right? No, that's not at all what this is saying. And we know this from chapter 20, God used the Assyrian army as an instrument of his wrath on Egypt, yet it says the Lord is riding a swift cloud because it's his judgment. It's his day of the Lord against Egypt. He says Egypt will trouble at his presence. God came to Egypt, but he didn't come physically to Egypt. How did he come? He came in judgment. His presence was made known through the judgment. But it was the Assyrians who were literally present. Psalm 18, 7 through 14, Joel 2, 1 and 2, they also speak of cloud comings. A cloud coming is a coming in judgment. So Christ's coming, spoken of in Revelation 1, 7, is a judgment coming which focuses on first century Israel. He says, those who pierced him. That's Israel. They're the ones who get the blame for the death of Christ. And as a consequence of His coming in judgment, it says all the tribes of the earth will wail. 
Earth here, again, is a translated from the Greek word gay, and it means soil, country, land. The tribes of the land is a familiar designation for Israel. The Jews crucified Yeshua, and they were punished for it. Acts 2.36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Yeshua who you crucified. He's talking to Israel, all right? And he blames them. You did it. It's your fault. You crucified him. And Yeshua told them that they would see his coming. Matthew 26, 63 and 64. But Yeshua remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. Yeshua said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. You're going to see me riding the clouds. You're going to see me as the cloud rider. What did the high priest priest do at that? Tore his robe, he screamed, ah, this is blasphemy, because he knew he's claiming to be God. The destruction of Jerusalem evidenced Yeshua's coming in the clouds for that historic group of people. But are we to see it only as a coming judgment on Israel? That's all it was. The full preterist or consistent preterist sees this judgment coming on Israel as the second advent of Christ. There's nothing more. All prophecy has been fulfilled. He said he would come in the lifetime of the disciples, not just to judge Israel, but he said he would come in the glory of his Father with his angels to reward every man. Matthew 16, 27, 28, the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. Then he will repay each person. That's a judgment. And these Thessalonians are going to, who are afflicting the Christians, they're going to get repaid according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Hang on. <clears throat> At Christ's coming, he's coming to judge the wicked, and he's coming to reward the righteous. And it was to happen quickly. In the parable of the tares in Matthew 13, we see that the judgment of the wicked and the reward of the righteous, they happen at the same time. All right? He says, 1330, let both grow together until the harvest. At the harvest, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. So here we see not only the tares are burned in judgment, a picture of destruction of Jerusalem, but the righteous are all gathered into the Father's barn. And then in verse 36 to 43, he says, Then he let the crowds, and then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain us the parable of the weeds in the field. See, they didn't get it. Okay? <laughs> Tell us what it's about. He answered, The one who sows the good seeds, the Son of Man, fields the world, the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. It tells us this is when it's going to happen. The end of the age, not world. I own age. And the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. Because at the end of the age, we have this judgment on Jerusalem where they're literally burned up. The Son of Man will send His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers. And throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is not picturing hell. It's picturing Jerusalem as it's literally being destroyed and burned down. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, who has ears to hear. Let him hear. Now the partial preterists say that this gathering will happen at a future second coming, which would actually, again, be a third coming. But the scripture teach that it happens at the same time as the judgment of Jerusalem at the end of the old covenant world. The scriptures also teach that both the righteous and the wicked dead will be resurrected on the same day. And we see in 1 Thessalonians that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of the archangel, the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The resurrection is described by John as being on the last day, referring to the last day of the Old Covenant, 
In John 6, 40, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. I'll raise Him up at the last day. So the time of the resurrection was not some far distant time over 2,000 years away. The time had arrived in that generation. And the inconsistent preterists believe in two second comings, one in AD 70 to judge Israel, and they believe in some physical final coming of Christ out in the future, again with no verses at all to back it up. And if they do believe that the second advent has not happened and it's still in the future, then would, that makes the law still in effect. The Torah is still in effect until it's all, until it's all gone, all right? Until heaven and earth pass away, the law stays intact. So let me ask you something. Has the law ended for Israel? When did it end? A.D. 70. But what about, they're still Jews today, right? They're still doing things, right? They're still, are they keeping the law? Why? No priesthood. No sacrifice. So since A.D. 70, you know, to make it clear to everybody, God says, I'm going to shut this down, and so you don't miss it, we're done. All right, he destroys Jerusalem. Since A.D. 70, the Jews have not sacrificed an animal. They do not have a priesthood. Now, I know there's all this talk about we're getting priests. We found, you know, there's no record, so we don't know who a priest is. And you know, according to Scripture, if you don't have your lineage, you can't just serve as a priest. But one of the main issues was sacrifice. They're not sacrificing. They go through the motions. Listen, in Judaism, every day, every day there were sacrifices, morning and evening. On the feast days... In tabernacle, they sacrificed 70 bulls. And yet the Jews today will say, we're keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Not even close. They made up their own and they just say, we're still doing it. God shut it down. History makes that so clear. It's over. They're done. There's no Jews today. There's no biblical evidence for a third coming. Now, I liked John Bray, a Southern Baptist evangelist, wrote a lot of preterist books. And for a time, John Bray said, there's no scriptural references to another coming. But, he says, I believe there will be one. <laughs> okay, at least he's honest. There's no scripture. I'm just believing it. You can believe whatever you want, right? And then about six months later, he said, that's dumb. It's all over. I mean, he realized it, it was dumb. You know, it's like, well, there's no scripture, so I'm not going there anymore. And he just, he gave up. He said, that's it. It's all over. It's all finished, okay? Because the, the only coming that Yeshua spoke of was one that was soon, shortly, in that generation, to those people. It was at hand. Listen how John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, ends the book of Revelation. He says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Yeshua, the grace of the Lord Yeshua be with all. Amen. Like I said, the end of this book, in this chapter, five times, he uses the word soon, shortly, quickly. How could he have stressed more clearly that this was the end? The destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 was a major apologetic point for the first century because Yeshua clearly said that the people of that generation were going to see His coming in judgment on Israel at the end of the age, and it happened. And John expected all these events to take place soon after he had written. Revelation was written to seven churches in Asia Minor to tell them what would happen soon, not soon to us 2,000 years later. It can't be soon then and soon later, okay? Thousands of years in the future. It's history to us. It tells us of events that happened 2,000 years ago. All right. Let's see if we can finish this sentence. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. Now this phrase can be understood in a couple different ways. It can be reflecting a Hebrew idiom. The majesty of the second coming will cause Yeshua to receive glory. And that's, I don't have a problem with that. But reflecting on the normal meaning of the Greek preposition, in addition to the unusual compound with the preposition repeated with the noun twice in 10 and 12, that Yeshua will be glorified in 
His believers. And I think that's the idea here. Christ will be glorified in, not by, but in His saints. That is, His glory will be mirrored in them. Although the saints have been despised and regarded as enigma by many, I mean, they're being persecuted, they're being attacked. This is going to reveal who the true children of God are. This is Romans 8. Okay, at the coming of Christ, Christ made it clear that the Jews are not his children. The Christians, those who trust Christ, are the people of God. He made that very clear. And once more, the apostles appealed to the Tanakh, taking this citation from the Greek version of Psalms 89.7, which says, God will be glorified in the council of his saints, where saints there probably refers to angels, but here the saints refers to believers. Those who have trusted Christ. And he says, to marvel at and to be marveled at among all who have believed. So believers, the second coming happens, they watch the city destroyed. They watch all the destruction. This is what Christ said he was going to do. He was going to destroy this temple. It, we watch it happen and they marvel. The word here, the Greek word is thumazo. And thumazo appears in Greek literature as a human response to the revelation or miracle of a deity that invoke admiration or wonder. And if you want to really capture the power of this word, I think we see it in Matthew 8, 26 and 27. They're out in a boat, and there's a storm going on. All right, To Jews, the water is the gateway to the underworld, to Sheol. Okay? So they don't like being on the water at all. Okay? They don't build homes on the water to stay away from the water. That's the gateway to the underworld. So they're out in the boat, they got a big storm, and they're screaming, you know, do something here, Yeshua. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Then he rose, he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now, if you can just picture this in your mind, this boat, if you've ever been to sea in a bad storm, and I have, okay, with the Navy, I was on a Spruance class destroyer, and the ship 252 feet, it was actually breaking apart. Cracks in the bulkhead. They had to change course because we were in a bad storm. You weren't allowed out on the decks because the waves were coming right over top of the decks. Okay, we were in the North Atlantic. It was a terrible storm. They're out in this huge storm and Yeshua says, stop, and boom, the water goes flat like glass. It's just, can you even fathom what, you know, what do these people think? What do these people think? A great calm. And the men marveled, thumazo. They're like, and watch what they say. What sort of man is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. I mean, they're just blown away. That's thumazo. It's just you marvel at God. All who have believed. This is an allusion to the Greek version of Psalm 68, 35. God will be marveled among his saints. And in citing the psalm, I think Paul substitutes one of his favorite designations of Christians, those who have believed, for saints. They are saints. And he says, because our testimony to you was believed. Now, whether the Thessalonian is to be judged to suffer destruction or to look forward to eternal glory hinges on this one word that Paul repeats twice. You have believed because you have believed. People, believing here is the difference between being one of God's children and not being one of God's children. All right? They believe the message that Paul preached. The gospel of Yeshua was believed. And Paul here is looking at man's responsibility in the gospel, and he said, you must believe. To not believe in Christ is to be damned. Now you say, okay, that's, why are you saying that? That's so simple, we all understand that. No, we don't, okay? There's people out there in the preterist movement claiming to be preterists who are preaching a gospel of damnation called universalism. And one of these, Cindy Coates, this lady preacher who claims to be a prophet, she's out there preaching, you don't have to believe. Everybody's saved. She said, I was saved 2,000 years ago. Everybody's saved. So what that does, people, is it destroys the gospel. Because the gospel says, you have to believe. But she says, you don't have to believe. You're already saved. You just don't know it yet. And so our job is to go tell people, you're already saved. That's all we got. I'll say, cool. Leave me alone then. 
What do I care? People, this is, this is damnable because it's attacking the gospel. And see, that's why my big beef with these partial preterists saying, you know, that we can't be Christians if we believe the Lord already returned. Where is eschatology part of the gospel? Okay? Where does it say, believe on the Lord Yeshua the Christ and have a correct eschatology, which is any eschatology except preterism, and thou shalt be saved? It doesn't say that, okay? Because that's not part of the gospel. And you're making the gospel really complicated if you've got to have your eschatology straightened out to get in there, okay? But when you attack the gospel like universalism does and says, everybody's going to be in, don't worry about it. Do what you want. You don't need to believe. Over and over. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, oh, you got to believe, shall not perish. But they're saying, no, no, you don't have to believe. God loved you and he paid for everybody. Don't, don't even worry about that believing part. You just, you're all in. Well, who is, who is the Lord coming to judge if everybody's in? Why the warnings? Everybody's in. People, we need to, listen, this is, this is serious stuff and we need to be aware and we need to deal with this kind of stuff, okay? The judgment coming of Christ in AD 70 brought wrath on unbelievers. Unbelievers got wrath and glory and eternal life to believers and believers only. Now, let me close with this, all right? I want to kind of wrap this up by focusing your attention on the gospel. Believer, when you get to heaven, will it be because of God's mercy or because of his justice? Who said yes? Okay, listen. It's both. That's important for you to understand. I mean, this is really important to understand. Do you understand that your eternal life is an act of justice? It is right for God to give you eternal life. It is just for God to give you eternal life. A.W. Tozer wrote this. Justice, when used of God, is a name that we give the way God is, nothing more. And when God acts justly, He is not doing so to conform to an independent criteria, but simply acting like Himself in a given situation. So you get what He's saying? God's just, that's just it. So the question is, well, how can God be just and still justify the ungodly? Well, that's the Christian doctrine of redemption, people. Tozer writes, it is, it is that through the work of Christ in atonement, justice is not violated, but satisfied. Redemptive theology teaches that mercy does not become effective toward man until justice has done its work. The just penalty for sin was enacted when Christ, our substitute, died for us on the cross. The just penalty for sin was enacted when Christ died for us. Listen, God's justice said sin must be paid for because He's just. And so Christ fully paid the penalty for His elect. Justice is satisfied. So God is merciful now to us and at the same time, He is just. Because the due punishment for sin has been paid, justice has been satisfied. I like to put it this way, believer. When you get to heaven, you'll deserve to be there. <laughs> you'll deserve to be there. You don't have to walk in with your head down, oh man, I should. No, listen, justice is satisfied. Everything that you did, every sin you ever committed in your life has been dealt with by Christ. Forever. And you stand before God in Christ. And in the person of Christ, you're as righteous, you're as just as Christ is because I share all He is and has. Okay? Because of Christ's sacrifice, because of what He did for me, God is just to bring us into His family, to adopt us as His children, to give us eternal glory. It's a matter of justice. 
I think if we can wrap our heads around that, it just frees us from so much of the condemnation the church puts on people today. You know, we sang in the songs earlier, it's not what you do, okay? It's not about you, it's about what God did for you, okay? Now, because God did that for you, yes, He wants you to live a righteous, holy life because you are an image bearer of God. And we're to take Him to the world around us by the way we live, by the way we interact with other people, by, by being just and righteous people ourselves. But I just want you to understand that, yes, if you have believed on the Lord Yeshua the Christ, then God in His justice has made you His own. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word, Lord. I, Father, sometimes it just seems so clear to me. I don't get why other people don't see things, but I know we all have our blind spots. Lord, I pray that you would give us all the heart of Bereans, that we would desire to know the truth. We would search for it. We would dig for it. We would not accept things we hear. And we wouldn't immediately reject things that we hear, but we would study them to see if they're so. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. We love you. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, Doug, you got me wound up with those videos, man, because I'm just like, this guy is calling us, me, a heretic, and he believes in two virgin births and two Emmanuels running around somewhere, you know? I just, yes, Gary. Well, I wanted to take a second to expand on Nate Evan Abihu for a bit and apply it to your message. Uh, Nate Evan Abihu offered incense on their own censers, not the sacred censer from the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And they went in together when the incense was supposed to be only offered by the high priest. So they were presuming upon the uh, position of the high priest, and they went in at not at the evening or morning sacrifice. So it was the wrong time, wrong uh, people, wrong position. It, so it seems like for minor infractions to us, that God takes his word, his law, serious, and he killed them for it. He absolutely does. On their ordination day, you figure, oh, God would cut them a little bit of slack. Hey, it's your ordination day. I'll, uh, we were... Uh, we always have the Christian radio station on in our car, and I hate when they talk because I'm like, wow, man. And I looked at Kathy, and I'm like, what in the world? And the guy said, it doesn't matter how you worship God. It's just as long as you're worshiping. And I'm like, well, John 44, John 4, 24 says, you shall worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So I think that matters how we worship God, okay? Because there's all kinds of people saying there were, there's homosexual churches out there that are meeting this morning and thinking they're worshiping God, okay? It's, he's worshiped in spirit and truth. Uh, Dana sends a question or comment. Thank you for good teaching. Revelation 1-7, are all the tribes of the earth in reference to the peoples of the 12 tribes of Israel? Yeah, that's the tribes of the land. It's, it's all referencing to Israel. Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's what it's about. It's not some future, you know, catacomb cataclysmic event that's happening to the world. This is from Norm. David, theologians constantly reiterate that Yahweh is eternal, yet dismiss the eternality of His new covenant. I agree. Yeshua paid an infinite price. Why should that only produce a finite return? What is it that we don't get everlasting? Excellent as usual. Thank you. You're right. It's, it's the new covenant doesn't have last days. Because it's an everlasting covenant. There's no end times. There's no last days. And that began at 8070. Was consummated at 8070. Began at Pentecost. Was consummated at 8070. We're in the new covenant. This is it, people. But because we're, so many people are still looking for physical things, they can't accept that. And it's from Gary and Chris and PA. Excellent work. We appreciate your work and studying. Futurism is starving the people of the glorious truth. What you believe is how you will live. I agree. And, you know, when you're looking for this great tribulation and things are going to get so bad and all this terrible stuff's going to happen and, you know, it's, 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 not very, it's not very encouraging. When all realize and the Lord's people see and realize this, there will be a much better life and more efficacious while they are here. Love and appreciate you. Thanks, Gary and Chris. I appreciate that. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think eschatology matters. You know, I mean, because so many people are looking for something. Uh, to me, the greatest thing is, you know, if you read Revelation, you're like, and the Lord Himself is going to be with them. He's going to dwell with His people. And the future is like, I can't wait for that to happen. It's like, it's happened. We're dwelling with Him now. He's here. He's now. We're not, we don't have to go to a temple somewhere. We don't take a sacrifice. Sacrifice has been paid. We're children. We go anytime, 24-7. Can meet with God any place, anytime. It's just a beautiful thing to understand who you are and what your position is in Christ. And not looking for things that you already have and not instead of enjoying them. Anybody else? Okay, Veronica. Um, but when I was you know, studying preterism for myself and, and wanted to find the physical resurrection verses and the Westminster Confession, only one was the one in Job that you just that you put up there. Um, but my Young's literal translation said, and after my skin hath compassed his body, then from my flesh I see God. Right. And it just made me so mad that they changed the words. I mean, this is the literal. Well, you got to understand it. And I was like, it's the only person that's not even right. All translators have bias, okay? All commentators have bias. Everybody has bias, and they try to bend it to what, you know, they want it to say. We, you know, we have to fight that. I have to fight that, too. If I find things that go against what I believe, I'm like, but why, why try to twist the Scripture? Why not just align with it, you know? I mean, unless you've got some axe to grind, I, I don't get it. Just try to figure out what the Scripture says and go with it. David? And to add to what Veronica said, the Hebrew word, or the phrase there where it says from, is the same Greek word, which I can't recall right now because it's been too long ago when I studied it, but it literally means from, out of, you know, so it's out of, yeah. right, speaking. So out of my flesh. In other words, right. I'm not going to be in my flesh. You're right. But again, that's the proof text. It's just like Isaiah 7.14. I mean, really? Really, there's two virgin births? That means there's two Emmanuels? I just, uh, it's beyond. That's how bad you want to defend a position that you will take and twist Scripture to make it I. <laughs> yes. There are some people who believe that um, there is a dual fulfillment based on Isaiah chapter eight verse three, which talks about um, Ahaz's son. Right. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Meher Shalal yeah. Hash. Right. He's almost gonna name Andrew that, but. <laughs> <laughs> but so some people see that as you know the the first son that was born. Right. But but, but do they say it was of a virgin? Right. I mean, even John MacArthur is saying, you know, but that wasn't a virgin birth, so we right. So it wasn't a fulfillment. That's my point. I know they try to make that the fulfillment, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like no, that doesn't. Matthew said this is that which was spoken of by the prophet. Okay, this is what Isaiah was talking about. Christ. That's it. Nothing in the future. Nothing in the past. It was that was the event that was prophesied. But they, you know, like I said, they try to try to get around all that stuff, you know. So in, in their view, there's multiple fulfillments of a lot of prophecies. Oh yeah, there is. There until is. they're satisfied. Not just yeah, one. again, yeah. until they decide which one is the final one, I guess. Because again, if, it, if it's a second, maybe it's pointing to something else. And, and, and like, you know, like Toby said, everyone's pointing to, they all point to something. Always. Always point to something else. Wow. So I wonder if the birth of Christ was just something typological that points to something else that's coming, you know? I mean, how, how far do we take this? <laughs> Doug, the guy who sent me these videos in the first place, says, after this sermon, Toby might be looking for his own bunker. <laughs> Maybe Biden will rent him some space in his. <laughs> now, you know, try to, uh, try to debunk the stuff they're saying without being 
sarcastic or critical. I, but it's mind blowing to me that these people claim to be the intelligent. You know, these they we're intelligent. We know better, and yet they come up with stuff like that. And I'm thinking, you don't, you can't believe what the scriptures say, but you can twist things to. I, it's 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 really it's beyond my comprehension. It really is. All right, let's. Uh, I think we're done here. Let's. Let me check something first. And make sure I'm not missing anybody. Uh, I don't know who this is from, but it says, "What time are we on now? What do we wait on now? Nothing. Lunch. We're not waiting on anything. Yeah, lunch. I guess <laughs> it's lunchtime. No, we're not. We're not waiting. We're not waiting for anything. When we die, when we physically leave this earth, we go into the realm of heaven to ever be with the Lord. You know, but we're not waiting for something to happen. And we shouldn't be waiting. We should be out there actively doing stuff. We're, again, we are image bearers. When people look at us, they see Christ. Or should. You ever heard that phrase, you're the only Bible some people will ever read? That's true. And when they look at us, they should see. And let me tell you, one of the greatest times I think you will be the best image bearer for God is when you are under persecution or tribulation. Because when everything's going well and you're just like smiling, happy, well, no kidding. I'd be happy too if everything's going my way. But when your life is crumbling and you're praising God and you're thankful and you're just, a, and they're like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Something's different. And they see that and it impacts their life. All right, come on up here, uh, band. Let's, let's close with this. Yes, um, just, just wanted to close with this, that before we sing this last song, I want to put this back in your mind, that when you get to heaven, you deserve to be there. Glory in His holy name. Let's sing glory in His name.